cited our uh, Dinesh, he is one of our Friday group member. Only Supreme Court uh, yesterday they designated him as a senior advocate. Mm -hmm. So give a huge clap. <laughs> Thank you. I specially requested Dama Shesha Dunayad, senior advocate, and former judge, Bombay High Court and Kerala High Court. He will give a bouquet of flower and felicitate Mr. P. Dinesh. Sir? Is it an sir? <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. So I, uh, I request you to say one or two words about the overall designations and Dinesh particularly. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I do deserve this opportunity for one reason. I know my friend Dinesh very well for at least last 10 years. And we have been friends from the days of Kerala. And uh, without quoting controversy, let me tell one thing. I was conferred senior designation. He earned it. There's a distinction between us. <laughs> and supposed to be, we are learned, right? Supposed to be. I don't claim any learning on that part. And learning makes you usually timid or somewhat conventional or we'll call it diplomatic. So most of the seniors are personification of diplomacy, including me. But you are going to have another genre of senior who always calls a spade a spade. I wish him all the best. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, of course, none of that, Justice Naidu. We have we had a very good uh, time in Kerala, not in conventional terms as you think. Uh, <laughs> and it was a wonderful judge in Kerala. Everybody liked this judgment because it's all literature, pieces of literature. And uh, uh, an gracious reader. That's how, because so many people who are uh, transferred to Kerala High Court served them, served her as judges. But his tenure was totally different. And uh, you know, he. He really assimilated into the Kerala culture and he was loved by everybody. And he also felt it as a home state. For other people, it was only a passing stage or phase in their life. But he really uh, involved very much. And uh, of course, uh, he learned, he started learning Malayalam. And he has got a lot of talents. A lot of talents. He's not like the person, any uh, conventional person as you think. Uh, yes, he's, uh, he has done research on health, a lot of health, keto diet, he's still following a keto diet and uh, following his keto diet, so many Supreme Court judges at that point of time, they also started following keto diet, okay, persuaded everybody and was loved by everybody. Uh, it's really a learning experience and uh, I'm a first generation lawyer, so uh, I've gone through a lot of struggle, I'm coming from a village. Uh, there is a separate journey. Uh, uh, so far as I am concerned, I am happy to share my journey with you at some point of time. We should continue. And I also, as he suggested, I also don't want to be a sort of conventional, I'm not blaming any person. Uh, but we are part of our country, where 70% of our people are really fighting for one meal a day. So we have a duty to the <coughs> system. And we should try. It should not be it's just senior means only for, or even legal profession per se, not even senior, why like AORs also, lawyers also. Uh, we are all becoming, because I remember once while this Narmada issue was uh, going on in Supreme Court, uh, Medha Patka, uh, I was helping her in one of the matters, and she said, we feel aliens in this place. Or these people are aliens and we are not, otherwise we are aliens and there's a cultural shock. Because this is not, this. This place has become so inaccessible to the common people in our country. So we have to bring in certain changes, some changes if possible. We have to help each other and uh, think about, not apart from making money, we should also think about our society and see that how, what best possible we can do. Thank you so much okay. for giving this. Thank you, Dinesh. All the best once again. Uh, 
Sheshad Naidu sir is going to speak on 15th, Enforcement of Foreign Judgment in India, correct sir, on 15th. So we are all eagerly waiting, already two times he addressed readings and other things. Thank, Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will be in touch. Sure. Thank you. Uh, now we will go for the real love, our regular topic. Today is our 207th Friday group meeting. Uh, the topic is uh, Artificial Intelligence and Law, Emerging Global and Indian Trends and Challenges. The speaker is our beloved Mr. Pawan Dugal, advocate, is a topmost international lawyer on this uh, cyber side. He immediately, the way it's a group messages and other things that circulated, so within a, in a few, in half an hour, 30 minutes, he accepted our invitation and he sent a topic also. Actually, supposed to be Friday, but if coming Fridays all up to December, we have four or five Fridays or holidays. So, so our friends are suggested let us shift it to the Friday, this Friday will go for 7. So luckily it uh, helped Dinesh also, his news came uh, for his elevation as a senior designation for that also helped. So luckily we got this thing. Now Pavanji is earlier, uh, 10th February 2017 he addressed our Friday group and 12th July 2019 also he addressed our Friday group and 12th May 2023 also he addressed and again today he gave a huge clap. Shishuji, friends, ladies and gentlemen, how many of you, us here use chat GPT? Please raise your hands. Okay, so I see almost half the people were using chat GPT. So let me take you uh, to the early part of 2023. 20th, uh, 30th of November 2022. <laughs> Chat GPT got launched. For those who uh, are not much familiar with Chat GPT, it's a kind of a artificial intelligence tool which is able to converse to you in a conversational manager manner like a human. Ask any question, and uh, Chat GPT is going to give a reply. Chat GPT was a precursor of the uh, this generative AI revolution. Since then, we've got many such stuff. So I'm taking you back to early 2023. It's one of those green cities in South India. There's a lawyer who's practicing in the civil side. And about 9.30 in the morning, in the night, he gets a knock on his door. There's some urgent matter that the client wants him to file tomorrow morning. <clears throat> so by the time it's midnight or beyond, the lawyer is able to get the facts. And he only has the night to draft the lawsuit and also to uh, go ahead and research on the the proposition on which the lawsuit is going to be based the only condition is that uh, the said lawsuit must be filed 10, 10 o'clock in the morning so when he has got very less time he's tech savvy he's heard about this new ai tool he goes to this ai tool and feeds in the proposition and looks for judgments when behold, he gets some Indian judgments and he gets some foreign judgments. He's not interested in foreign judgments because he's going to an Indian court. So he takes care of two judgments, which are from India, and incorporates them as part of the pleadings to substantiate his thought process and have it filed the next morning. One day after filing, something prevails upon the lawyer and he says, okay, I have now filed this in a great amount of hurry. Let me review through my judgments. And then to his horror, he finds that both these judgments are fabricated, false. They don't exist. The <coughs> parties don't exist. The judgment was never delivered. Uh, and therefore, he's in a quandary. So he calls in a great amount of tearing hurry to find out what he should do. 
Well, I tell him that the best thing is now to go ahead and either amend, but even better to withdraw with leave to file afresh. Fortunately, before anything goes up, he's able to withdraw the matter and the position closes. This is an unreported case in India. That's in the early part of 2023. A couple of months later, action replay happens this time in the US. In the US, this is this famous case of Stephen Schwartz. Stephen Schwartz belongs to a law firm. They are into civil aviation litigation. They are supposed to be filing an urgent written submissions before an American district court. And they have paucity of time. They know of this new tool called ChatGPT. So they go to ChatGPT and give the proposition and asks ChatGPT to please prepare this entire written arguments, written submissions. The written submissions are prepared by ChatGPT almost in the next few minutes. And it quotes six different US courts cases on the same propositions. Now, as a lawyer, they go ahead and tell ChatGPT you've actually quoted six US cases. Please confirm whether they are correct and whether the proposition that you are relying upon is correct. ChatGPT responds, sir, absolutely fine. They are, we have rechecked it. Nothing to worry. Please go ahead. So lo and behold, they file this written submissions before the court. The opposite party, the opposite counsel, presents to the court that, sir, we got these written submissions, but they are relying on six cases. We can't find these six cases anywhere. Could you please ask them to give these copies of six cases? So the court puts the counsels to notice that could you actually supply these copies? The counsels, rather than doing their homework and due diligence, still stick on to the guns that these are unreported cases. And then the court realizes and comes to a decision that it is facing an unprecedented situation. Why? Because all the six cases are fake. The parties don't exist. The judgments don't exist. The litigations never happened. So that's when the US court says, we are not against the use of artificial intelligence. But we are expecting lawyers to be gatekeepers. We want you to do certain basic due diligence. And you can get those inputs. But if you're going to rely upon those inputs without appropriate authentication or verification, then somewhere down the line, consequences have to go ahead and visit you. Consequently, in this first of this kind case in the world, the US courts actually imposes $5,000 fine on the two lawyers and the law firm for relying upon fake cases generated by artificial intelligence. Now that's actually sent the entire legal fraternity in great amount of dizzy. Why? Because everybody was wondering that this generative AI or artificial intelligence is the next biggest miracle that can happen in your lives. It's going to be the best Aladdin's uh, slave. It can go ahead and do anything that you would want to and that we will be relatively free. Now these cases have only begun to start saying there is now a new guardrail thought process that's emerging. And now if I look at the US states, 21 different US courts have now issued specific guidelines and orders to the effect that any lawyer who files a lawsuit or a civil action or any action before that court of law, they will have to certify under their signatures that what they are filing has not been generated by artificial intelligence or that even if it is so generated by artificial intelligence, the lawyers have checked up the authenticity or veracity of the same. That's the way how the jurisprudence has evolved from the last year till now as we talk. And this is like a growing fire, forest fire. It's going to keep on happening as we go forward. From America, I take you back to India. The time is February 2024. Uh, one of the big international tele uh, IT players launched their own version of uh, generative artificial intelligence. And then somebody in India asks a question to this generative AI about the Indian Prime Minister. The Indian Prime Minister. And lo and behold, the generative AI tool gives an answer to the prior about the activities of the Prime Minister and uses certain very, very derogatory words, which are only used exceptionally in the case of some very bad examples in the last century. 
So consequently, this gets to the attention of the government. The government of India wants an explanation, and the service provider comes back and saying, "Sir, sorry, our AI algorithm made a mistake." But don't blame us. In our terms and conditions, we have also categorically said that this is generative AI. It's bound to make mistakes. So please don't uh, rely upon it. But nonetheless, they said, "Look, we will have a look at that." But that's not all. It's triggered off some new developments. But before I come to these new legal developments, let me take you to uh, yet another town, which is about 200 kilometers from Delhi. It's a small place called Rurki. On the outskirts of Rurki, next to Haridwar, there's a medical practitioner. He's very, very famous. He's uh, known for his unique uh, skills for treating arthritic pains. So, lo and behold. One of my friends was going there. I said, "Let me accompany you because <coughs> I want to get some uh, medicine for my mother." So we went up to this uh, doctor, who is in a mufasil area uh, on a side road. There are almost about 200 people waiting outside his clinic. There's complete chaos, and you have to wait for three, four hours to get to your turn with the doctor. So we wait out three, four hours, and then our turn reaches. And uh, while we are giving the symptoms of the patient, the doctor seems to be in a state amount of listening and working on his computer. He is not interested about looking at the medical documents. He is interested about your symptoms, and he is very officiously uh, typing on his computer. And then he starts writing his prescription. I get curious. I ask him, sir, you are so famous. You got so many clients and patients waiting out. You are working on the computer. What is it that you are working on? He said, "Sir, you will not know." I said, "Sir, please educate me." <laughs> so he said, "Well, there is a new pro program called uh, Chat GPT, and I am using it. So I put in the symptoms, and it gives me the salt, which I have to use. And then, using that particular salt, I am writing my prescriptions. And then it started dawning upon me how in India people have begun started relying upon artificial intelligence." As the next big miracle in their lives, without having any uh, kind of sense of urgency in terms of reliance upon the uh, AI or the outputs that are going to generate it therefrom. So that's in a nutshell where we currently stand. But I was talking about the Prime Minister of India example. Immediately after that, on 1st to March 2024, the uh, government of India has now got come up with certain advisories. I'll talk about that advisories later, but let me now take you over. We are not alone in this journey of artificial intelligence. Everywhere, everybody is relying upon artificial intelligence. In fact, from 30th of November, 2022, till the time when we talk in the first week of March, 2024, the world seems to have been conquered by this huge wild forest fire called artificial intelligence or generative artificial intelligence. Every stakeholder is. Wanting to use it, there's not a single area of human activity that's not yet uh, either touched or untouched by AI. Everything is going to be touched. So consequently, when I look at AI and law, my question to myself is: What do I need to know about it as a lawyer? First of all, do I need to know about artificial intelligence law at all, or it's something decades into the future? Why do I need to know about it? And the answer that I get in the ecosystem is, whichever practice of law that you are practicing in, I think artificial intelligence law will have to be one area that you will have to be sensitized about. Why? Because you, the people in your uh, office, your clients, your opposing counsels, the opposing law litigants are all going to be using this particular fantastic new technological paradigm. So, therefore, trying to understand the legalities of AI will be very important. So. The fundamental question: Is there something called artificial intelligence law? Is there a is there a discipline? The answer for that is yes. There is a small sub new discipline of law emerging called artificial intelligence law. This discipline of law is only dedicated to dealing with the legal, policy, and regulatory issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and generative artificial intelligence. So, where does AI law fit in the broad? Scheme of legal jurisprudence. Well, artificial intelligence law is one sub-discipline of law that's evolving under the broad umbrella of cyber law as a jurisprudence. 
we began with cyber law almost about 30 years back. Over a period of time, cyber law has been growing. And under this massive umbrella, different smaller disciplines of law have started coming in. We've seen cybercrime law emerging. Then we saw cyber security law emerging. We've seen Internet of Things law emerging. And now we have artificial intelligence law that's emerging. So that's going to be there. And that will be relevant for you in case you are using AI. But then what are the important trends that you see on the horizon today when I talk about artificial intelligence law? The first biggest trend is, is artificial intelligence law recognizing the legality of output of artificial intelligence? Well, it's so simple. I can give any prompt command to any program and I can get an answer. Is the answer legal? In the sense, can I rely upon the answer? So, there is no specific development in this regard, but then this is one area that's increasingly getting covered under the broader principles of the UNCTAD model law on electronic commerce, which has been a model law granted by the United Nations, under which different countries have come up with their distinctive national cyber laws, which primarily say that they are granting legality to the electronic format. So the output from an AI program is nothing but an output from a computer. And that being so, it becomes an electronic data or electronic record. And electronic records are by and large granted legality across the world in different cyber laws as we go forward. So first things first, the output of AI is legal. Next question, can the output of AI be relied upon without appropriate verification or authentication? That's a million dollar question. Why? Because in artificial intelligence algorithms, a new kind of disease has started coming in. I call it a disease. Others call it a trend. And this is the trend of hallucination. We are all familiar with the concept of hallucination, where we are hallucinating things, imaginary things in our minds under certain circumstances. Imagine if this kind of hallucinatory approach is adopted by algorithms. And that is what's known as hallucination by artificial intelligence. That is, its ability to talk complete false things to you in such a confident manner that even you get foxed to even realize that, look, uh, whether it's true or not, I don't even exactly know. So hallucination of data is happening big time on AI. And there are various reasons that are going to be attached to the same. But primarily speaking, we realize that hallucination is also happening because of the kind of data that's being fed into AI and also on the basis of kind of codes that are being written by artificial intelligence coders. So if I'm an AI coder and I have a vicious idea in my mind or a vicious thought process in my mind, then what will I do? The chances of me writing a code so as to fulfill the said vicious content or intent is going to be very likely. And if that algorithm is so coming up, and that starts generating content uh, which has such vicious elements as part of it, you're bound to be in trouble. So the ability of the AI to generate these false cases is also <coughs> phenomenal. Today afternoon, before coming here, I went again to one of these uh, AI platforms looking for some latest case that's been done by, by an Indian court. And it prompted me a case uh, uh, citation. And I searched across all on uh, social media, on search engines, on law journals, and I was not able to find the case. So I was only relaxed to say, okay, so we are still in an age where hallucination of data is happening, and as lawyers, as users of AI, we should not use it, or use it with care and caution. I will actually say that artificial intelligence output is like a sexy fire. From the outside, it appeals to you, but it's a ball of fire, it's in your hand. If you're not going to deal it carefully, the chances of going and it burning you or causing injury to you is going to be very high. So as lawyers, we will have to be very, very careful. That's the reason why there's a law firm. I'll not name the law firm. They've got 1,800 lawyers across the world. And they have now mandated in this year, 2024, that all their 1,800 lawyers will be mandated to use two of the topmost AI programs, ChatGPT and Microsoft Copilot. Why? Because the law firm wants to inculcate a discipline amongst the lawyers that despite having the best powers of AI with them, they should inculcate the discipline of having 
self research self analysis or not immediately relying on, on the output before they are generating this kind of stuff so clearly hallucination is a big problem try uh, asking about yourself to any of these generative ai platforms and the chances are that the ai platform is going to fib things as we call about uh, talking falsities about you it may look very vague it may uh, even be uh, you know greatly helpful to you and you'll feel very nice wow this is being said about me which we know is not correct but no problem others will also know about it so my my knowledge my awareness and my image is going to be enhanced but over a period of time you have to realize that this kind of an output will have to be uh, controlled at in terms of getting relied upon so that's one big issue one of the other big issues today uh, relates to ethics ethics now ethical behavior is a human behavior we like to do ethical stuff ethics is a value of humanity can we expect machines to be ethical that's a fundamental question that we have not been able to address so much more than 150 organizations across the world have come up with their own distinctive set of ethical principles and guidelines which artificial intelligence needs to follow but how do you actually make or ensure that the program follows these ethical guidelines is a big big question so there's a lot of slip between the cup and the lip so the service providers <coughs> the ai algorithms will have to make sure that at the time when we are creating the said algorithm we must put in uh, elements parameters which are ethical in nature so that the system starts adopting adopting ethical behavior ethical principles as part of its day to day practices so clearly ethics is at, at best only voluntary the moment it starts having the force of law behind it then it's the time it starts getting more compulsory more mandatory now in our country we find and across the world also we find a basic dilemma should we take law and bring ethical principles to have the mandate of law or should we actually leave it to the subjective discretions or whims and fancies of the concerned ai uh, algorithm creators or coders the world is still not very clear but yes this is one big area that the world is slightly concerned with yet another important legal issue that ai law is actually throwing up deals with bias now just because an output is coming from a computer or an ai algorithm does not mean that it will be 100% impartial it will ultimately be dependent on what kind of data sets have been used for training the said ai algorithms and consequently if the data sets are poisoned or they are not very very objective the chances of the so called intelligence of the machine uh, depicting this kind of uh, uneven balance is going to be very high so there was a particular research that was done in the us where they found out that uh, the ai algorithm was coming up with results which primarily were discriminating against people who were not of white skin and then they found out that the problem for this was that the data that was primarily fed for the purposes of training the ai algorithms was primarily a white skin color dominant data and that's why the program felt that well all my data that's been fed in pertains to people with white skin so let's presume that the people with non white skin could potentially be not up to the mark and therefore it bound to, uh, it was bound to create a very bias or discriminatory approach so across the world people are saying we now need to work across to minimize the so called bias or discrimination that can be generated or that can be perpetuated by artificial intelligence yet another important issue for artificial intelligence law has got to do with the entire issue of cyber security now you will say what has got cyber security got to do with artificial intelligence please realize that artificial intelligence at the end of the day is only a computer program so if i am able to hack into the computer system or the cyber security of the ai algorithm the chances of me trying to go ahead and tamper with the output or the results of the algorithm is going to be very high so one of the key important priorities <coughs> for law will have to be that the cyber security of artificial intelligence must be appropriately well preserved and the breach of cyber security of ai algorithms needs to be brought specifically within the ambit of illegality or penality well to that extent number of countries have dedicated laws on uh, cyber crime or cyber laws which make hacking or computer related offenses as penal offenses so to that extent the breach of cyber security could be covered therein 
but I think it's going to be far beyond. What kind of due diligence parameters, what kinds of uh, basic reasonable security practices and procedures uh, would law want to actually stipulate for AI service providers and developers is going to be one fundamental key thrust area as far as AI law is going to be concerned. Yet another very important concern for AI law will pertain to privacy. Do you expect privacy in the hands of a ruthless machine? I think we are going to be mistaken if we are going to uh, go ahead and rely that uh, we have privacy in an AI ecosystem. I'll tell you an example of a real case that took place. Early days when this generative AI platforms had started coming in, somebody in India came to know about it. Well, you came to hear it from your friends, from your colleagues. And this gentleman is a public personality. He's got a <coughs> reputation of being a womanizer, a Casanova. He's got, his own set, he's got his own set of problems. So he logged in using his own personal name, ID, and then asked his personal question to the generative AI, saying, I am so-and-so, I've got seven girlfriends simultaneously. These are the names of the girlfriends, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know how to manage them. Could you please give me a girlfriend management plan? The AI program gave a girlfriend management plan. And the gentleman started implementing the plan. Somebody in his office came to know that he had gone to this AI program. So that somebody went to the AI program and said that, sir, there is this personality called Mr. ABC. He's got various girlfriends. We don't know their names. Could you name the girlfriends? The program names all the seven girlfriends by name. So today when Indians are in a vomiting environment, we are in a new revolution. I call it the great Indian vomiting revolution. We are vomiting all kinds of personal information on AI algorithms without thinking that this personal information of mine is going to be used by the AI algorithm for training itself. It's likely to become a part of public data and therefore I'm going to lose any kind of uh, privacy that's going to be uh, in intrinsically inherent in this kind of personal information. So privacy issues are going to be phenomenally very, very significant in the context of AI per se. Yet another important legal issue for AI and law will have to deal with data protection. Do we expect AI to protect my data? Not at all. That's an answer comes from one of my colleagues. And I think that's bang on target. I am using a Rampuri knife. The knife that's made in the famous area of Rampur in Uttar Pradesh. Now the Rampuri knife can be used by me for cutting vegetables or for murdering. It's dependent on how I'm going to use it. So I can't hit a Rampuri knife liable for my use of Rampuri knife. However, will that same example be applicable in the context of AI coder? I don't think so. Why? Because AI coder has now developed a program which is directly intrinsically impacting human mind, human perception, and human lives, apart from having an impact upon human society. So the coder can't say, sir, I have developed this program. And I don't know how it's going to work. So please don't make me liable. I cannot even predict how my program is going to work. That's a classical argument that's being put by various coders when this issue of liability is coming up. And globally, people are saying, well, we can't go across this legal path. Why? Because your AI is no normal technology. It's a technology that's got having a huge game-changing, transformative nature <coughs> as we're going forward. So in that kind of a scenario, the entire issue is coming up. How much are we going to make? companies liable for output of generative AI. So recently, in the last few months, we've seen a spate of cases happening in the US. And most of these cases relate to liability and relate to another connected area of intellectual property rights. So when I'm actually asking certain query on an AI algorithm, I'm not very sure that the output that the algorithm is giving me, is it original or has it been copied from somewhere? So a number of authors in the US have now sued AI companies saying, sir, we are the creators of these original literary works, these novels, these books, and these books have been used for training your AI algorithm without my consent, without my permission, without substantially compensating me. So please, this is a classical case of infringement of copyright. Please go ahead and grant damages. So a number of these lawsuits are currently pending as far as intellectual property rights and AI is going to be concerned. Uh, these, none of these have been decided, so we'll have to wait and watch how things will evolve. But substantially, the law of tort 
principles could be weighing in the minds of the U.S. courts as they are going to go ahead and deal with the liability. But can the service provider say that, sir, I'm a mere service provider. I'm based in America. I'm governed by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And that <coughs> being so, I'm entitled to complete exemption from legal liability. I think that's one fundamentally very big gray area that the courts will have to deal with. In the Indian context, will an AI coder be able to say, sir, I'm an intermediary. I'm a network service provider. And under Section 79 of the Indian Information Technology Act 2000, I cannot be made liable for what is actually flowing through my program. Now, those are very contentious questions that will have to be addressed. But clearly, the entire issue of legal liability in artificial intelligence law is a very, very hot and a contentious issue. Further, can we actually treat artificial intelligence as an inventor or a co-inventor or an author or a co-author? Now, that's a million-dollar question for which there's no <coughs> crystal clear answers. Uh, recently, Amazon came up with a survey. They found out that after these launch of these generative AI programs, there has been a quantum leap in the increase of the number of authors that have started writing for, uh, for Amazon. And the number of authors are very, very honest. They are saying, I've written this book <coughs> thanks to ChatGPT or thanks to this particular AI program, and I acknowledge this program as a co-author. Now, to that extent, it's fine. I go to the terms and conditions of ChatGPT, which tells me that whatever you generate will be your intellectual property rights because you it will be dependent on what query that you're going to generate. Ideally, it will be nice if you can mention my name that this my output has been generated by ChatGPT. But even if you don't mention it, no problem. I'm okay with that. But how about the fact that if I am a so-called author and I generate my every uh, pub, uh, my written uh, synopsis or my written note on the basis of an AI program and I say it's generated by me and should tomorrow uh, there will be found to be some deficiencies or inadequacies, then can I be made liable or can the AI program be made liable and uh, who's going to be made responsible for the copyright infringement? <coughs> because I trusted the AI program that it's going to be honest, it's going to go ahead and uh, give me the correct information without realizing that AI programs may not ultimately give me the correct information and they may be relying upon a lot of output in this regard. So those are some key things that are coming forward as far as AI law is concerned. There are a lot of other issues, but I want to come on and take you on to another journey. If these are the issues, where are we standing today on artificial intelligence law? Globally, do we have a law? The answer is a crystal clear no. There's no international global law on artificial intelligence yet. Does that mean, is there some law in progress? Well, the United Nations Ad Hoc Committee on Cybercrime is now negotiating a new international draft of an international convention to prevent the misuse of information and communication technologies for criminal purposes. And that's been broadly, widely drafted. Maybe some aspects of AI could be brought under the same, but we'll have to still <coughs> wait and watch. Because at the time when we are talking, it's still a draft treaty. It's not yet been adopted either by the United Nations or by uh, any of the member states. So if that's the position, where are we on artificial intelligence law in the form of countries? So countries are saying, there's nothing internationally, okay? I'm not going to be waiting. I will be more proactive. So there are two kinds of bucket actions that countries have taken. The first bucket is countries are saying, let me come up with my national artificial intelligence policies. Why? This will be policy which will envisage my vision of what I as a country, as a nation, would want to do for encouragement or adoption of AI. So I see number of countries having come up with dedicated uh, national cyber uh, AI policies for promotion of AI. But that's one part of the bucket. That's where majority of the countries are still. The second part of the bucket is a more adventurous bucket, where countries are saying, no, 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 I'm not only going to only deal with the national AI policy, I'm going to come up with legal frameworks. And that's a very, very small group of nations which have come up. And there's a third group, the third bucket, which is the wait and watch bucket. These are countries which are saying, well, it's an emerging technology. I would want to wait and watch. I would not want to come up with an AI national strategy. I don't want to come up with a national AI law. Let me wait and watch, and then I will actually decide. So let me come to the second bucket, which is the bucket of countries who have already now legislated on artificial intelligence. A handful of them, but these represent three distinctive directions in which AI law is developing. The first 
country in this regard is China. China has come up with the world's first law on generative artificial intelligence and they implemented the law on 15th of August 2023. This is one of the world's large, very large and very comprehensive set of legislation dealing with a variety of aspects pertaining to generative AI, pertaining to the rights, duties and responsibilities of AI stakeholders and also pertaining to the need for auditing, the need for companies in China to submit their AI programs for the approval and auditing of the state authorities before them being allowed to release their artificial intelligence programs in the market. So they want to basically audit AI programs on the ground that what's going to be the impact of the same on national interest or on public interest. So they also want to make sure there's no discrimination or bias. So that's the first set of legislation that's come up. <coughs> that's August 2023. And few months later, come December 2023, and you realize that the European Union uh, passes this AI law or Artificial Intelligence Act, which is also seeking, seeking now to go ahead and deal with artificial intelligence issues, but from the perspective of public harm. What's going to be the harm on the people at large? And how can we go ahead and mitigate those harms? They're also they are focusing on more audits, more transparency, more accountability as compared to other stakeholders. That's Europe. Then from Europe, I take you to America. In America, New York has implemented a dedicated law on artificial intelligence, particularly for the employment sector. And there they are saying one crystal clear message that we want your AI programs to be free from any discrimination or bias. Therefore, you will have to undergo mandatory auditing of your AI programs. Now, this comes in a couple of years after 1st of January 2020. That was the day when the state of Illinois became the first state in the world to come up with a dedicated law on artificial intelligence, which is the uh, Illinois Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act of 2020. So that's the three models that we are working on globally. There are more than 120 different models of laws which are pending before different countries and the legislations at the time when we talk. So I expect the year 2024 to be very fertile in terms of more countries coming up with more laws uh, to deal with various aspects of uh, AI and its regulation. That brings me to another question. Can a law be drafted by artificial intelligence? Well, logically so, the answer is a yes. So, but can it be tested? Can it be implemented? And now you have a unique case. This is from the Latin American uh, subcontinent, where in one of the municipalities in one country, a uh, municipal cooperator proposed a new municipal law. The law was presented to the municipal house and passed by the municipal house in totality, and the law got implemented. Two months after the law got implemented, the cooperator has now disclosed that I did not write the law, I got the law written from Chad GPT. Now, the fundamental quandary amongst uh, policy makers. We passed this law, this law is now already in place and now we've come to know about it, that this law has been authored by artificial intelligence. So it's time for us to scurry back into some more review, more, some more analysis and trying to see whether there are need for appropriate uh, amendments in that law or not. So that's what's currently happening. Very interesting time frame. That brings me from the global journey to India. Where are we in India on artificial intelligence? And I'm very, very clear on certain things. India, at the time when we talk, does not have a dedicated law on artificial intelligence. Does India have a national policy on artificial intelligence? Yes, we have a national uh, strategy and a policy on artificial intelligence of 2018. And that actually encapsulates the vision of the government on how it wants to go ahead and encourage the adoption of AI. But is there a law on artificial intelligence in India? At the time when I talk with you, there is no law. Well, that's factually correct, but then there's a slight caveat. The caveat is, some portions of artificial intelligence could still be brought to be covered under the ambit of the Indian Cyber Law, being the Information Technology Act 2000. Why? Because the Information Technology Act 2000 is dealing with seven raw materials. The use of computers, computer systems, computer networks, computer resources, communication devices, as also data and information in the electronic form. And ultimately, an uh, AI algorithm is nothing but a computer program. It's resident on a computer. It's churning out electronic data. So some broad building blocks of AI ecosystem could be covered under AI 
under this uh, Indian Information Technology Act 2000. But uh, you can't blame the law. This is a 24-year-old law. At that point of time, nobody had the slightest of clue that this new technology called AI, specifically generative AI, is going to come and completely change the landscape. So having said that, what does India require? I think I'm clear that India requires a dedicated law on artificial intelligence because the provisions of the Information Technology Act 2000 and the rules and regulations are not fully applicable in terms of meeting up with the challenges of artificial intelligence. In that particular regard, the government has already said one thing. The government has said, well, we will be now soon coming up with AI. So towards the later part of 2024, it's been announced that India is going to be coming up with a Digital India Act. And they are expecting that there will be a chapter on artificial intelligence under the Digital India Act. So that's a great move, except uh, from a practitioner standpoint, it will be wonderful if India can have a dedicated law, because this area of artificial intelligence is going to touch almost every aspect of human endeavor and activity in the Indian ecosystem. Second question, uh, has AI crime, crime started happening? The answer is a clear yes. Go to the dark net and you start realizing a new offering today. That offering is cybercrime as a service powered by artificial intelligence. Which means that now cyber criminals are saying, I'm not even going to do the dirty hands uh, myself. So you order me a cybercrime, I will get it done from an artificial intelligence and I will get my money and I will pay the AI guy also some money and everybody is happy. Why? Because the police will never be able to find out who has actually committed the crime. So that's now the new paradigm that started happening. Uh, those issues pertaining to AI crimes will have to be also appropriately addressed. That's one fundamental question. So in a scenario like this, my question to myself, what do I really need to do as I go forward in the context of the Indian judicial system? Well, first and foremost, the Supreme Court needs to be complemented for its thought leadership, for extensively coming up with now new programs which are relying upon AI for translation, for uh, clubbing of things and variety of other stuff. The AI committee of the Supreme Court has done some yeoman's work in this regard. But then, has artificial intelligence matters reached court in India? That was a question I asked myself. And I found out that there were two matters where already these kind of issues have come to the courts in India. I first take you to the first half of 2023, where a matter pertaining to bail was actually being argued before the Punjab and Haryana High Court. And that was Jaswinder Singh alias Jassi was the state of Punjab. Here in this particular matter, the uh, Punjab and Haryana, Haryana High Court uh, Justice said that, well, I went to this AI program called ChatGPT and I put a query pertaining to legal jurisprudence on <coughs> bail. And this is what the answer was. I've gone through the same and I find that actually aptly re represents the true position. And on that basis, I now proceed ahead to go ahead and give my, uh, my judgment on this bail matter. It's the first instance where we find a high court actually quoting the output from generative AI, like chat GPT, and acknowledging that it's had gone ahead and reviewed the authenticity and veracity of the same. That was in the earlier part of 2023. Come towards the last quarter of 2023, and a very unique kind of a case comes up before the Delhi High Court. This is a case pertaining to infringement of intellectual property rights, pertaining to shoes. And uh, this is a very interesting name, and the name is called Christian Lawbottin versus Shoe Boutique. In this matter, the plaintiff in the pleadings said that, Sir, I went to chat GPT and asked these queries about this brand. And these are the queries. So these further go ahead and substantiate my case that uh, there's a violation or infringement of intellectual property rights. So please go ahead and rely upon the chat GPT for the purposes of giving a decision. The Delhi High Court recognized the fact that this AI tool is now being used, but I said that the AI tools are not yet so much mature enough to be relied upon either for the purposes of adjudication of either factual matrix or the legal matrix. And the High Court said that till now, the, the technology has not reached that particular level that this particular technology needs to be used for adjudication of cases. So this is the second big case where the Delhi High Court said that we recognize these tools are important. We recognize that the lawyers are going to use it, but we are also advocating care and caution because uh, till such time they, be, they come up with a reasonable level of maturity. They are not necessarily going to be very, very reliable in the entire issue of administration of justice. 
So these are two things that have come in. There was also a case on Telangana, but that was more a case where a gentleman had used a chat GPT for the purposes of uh, writing an examination, an online examination, and doing some cheating. There was no adjudication on chat GPT issues per se. So this is what where we are currently standing. Does that mean that more <coughs> issues pertaining to AI, chat GPT are not going to come up? I think they are now increasingly going to come up. So as lawyers, whichever area of work that you are working in, you will have to really go ahead and be, make yourself more conversant with these facts because this is one technology that's not going away. Uh, we can say we can be traditional, but what about your opponent who will go, to have, go ahead and use it? What about the electronic evidence that's going to be now generated by artificial intelligence? And then party is going to rely upon such uh, generative artificial intelligence, electronic evidence for either proving or disproving their own particular cases. Because today, you can write any algorithm, you can write any program, you can come up with any output. And so much so now, there's a new program that OpenAI has launched. It's called Sora. This is a program which allows you to just generate any kind of videos in the world by giving a text command. So if I was to give a text command, please prepare a video of lawyers listening to the Friday Group program. It's going to generate its own unique kind of video uh, sh showing uh, how lawyers are listening to various lectures at the Friday Group at the Supreme Court. Now that's fantastic, except that the contextualization has still not reached a level of maturity. In one of the recent videos, they, somebody asked them to prepare a video pertaining to chairs on a beach. And the program generated a video which showed one chair on the beach. And the program also share, showed a new chair that's been generated from the sand. And the chair then being flying in the thin air and stuff like that. So context is currently one area that work will have to work on. But going forward, I think everybody will have to be quickly realizing that AI is not going away. It's going to become huge problematic. And as lawyers, we will have to be appropriate guardrails, appropriate due diligence parameters before we really go ahead and rely upon the same. And that brings me to the final issue. Where do we stand today on AI law? And how much are we expecting in terms of growth? So today, in March 2024, that's when we talk. If we were to write a book on artificial intelligence law in uh, end of 2030, and if the book was to be of 100 pages, then in March of 2024, we are only at the fourth or the fifth page of this 100-page book. This is going to give, give you a small idea of how quickly these rapid developments in artificial intelligence law are going to come up. So going forward, we should always be going ahead and applying our mindsets to these new emerging technologies. Don't worry whether it's not applicable to your area of practice. Don't uh, be afraid that this is technology which is overwhelming. Yes, it's going to overwhelm you. Why? I'll tell you. July of 2023, this company called OpenAI, which has generated chat GPT, has launched a new project. The name of the project is very unique. It's called Super Intelligence Alignment Project. In the project, they are saying, give us four years. And in the next four years, we are now going to come up with a new kind of super intelligence that will supersede human intelligence. We may be more ambitious, maybe a half, an hour, half a year more or less, but we will be there. So if the next four or five years, we are going to see a super intelligence that's going to supersede human intelligence, the time has come that we must start building in guardrails now. That's why I recently authored a book called Super Intelligence in Law, where I've advocated the specific legal parameters that need to be built in the building process of super intelligence as we go forward. Because once super intelligence is beyond us, there's no way we are going to ever be able to control this AI. And if that's going to happen, then uh, the time for reigning it right now is what's most important. And these legal parameters will have to be uh, put in place. Also, my new book on uh, law of generative AI is also talking about some of the key parameters that I think as lawyers we need to keep in mind as we go forward. So final two messages. What is there in this for lawyers and the legal fraternity? And number two, are there some resources available? Well, let me come to the second question first. On resources, I've created a new course. It's called uh, Artificial Intelligence Law and Regulation, which is on uh, Udemy. You can go and do that course. It's just a short course, about an hour or so. But more significantly, it's uh, from a practical standpoint of what you need to know as a practitioner of AI and AI law is concerned. Regarding the final message, 
what is it that lawyers and the legal fraternity need to keep in mind when they deal with these challenges of AI? I think the messaging is loud and clear. I cannot run to the Himalayas. I have to be in this digital ecosystem. Therefore, I will have to start facing this technology very quickly. Yes, I will be overwhelmed. I will feel myself very strange in this ecosystem. But having said that, I think we'll have to quickly realize that human intelligence at the current level is far, far more superior than artificial intelligence, though it's a transient period in human history. So we should try to adopt our human intelligence to not completely blindly rely upon artificial intelligence and output, but start putting in our own respective ingenuity because there's a new revolution that start coming in, which is very problematic. This is the revolution of artificial stupidity. People are becoming artificially stupid. Why? Because they have started relying upon artificial intelligence for everything and anything under the sun. And they are vomiting all kinds of their information on this AI algorithms only to realize that their privacy and data protection gets uh, completely evaporated over a period of time. I'll finally like by concluding by saying, artificial intelligence law is a work in progress. It's developing as we talk. But it's going to see some massive quantum changes and advancements in the next few years. Therefore, as legal fraternity, let's be alive to these developments. Let's be looking at how laws are evolving themselves. Let's come up with our own effective practices. Some educational institutions, by the way, have banned ChatGPT from their own uh, institutions because students are using ChatGPT for making their assignments or their programs. But then banning is not a, pollution, uh, not a solution because if you ban them in your premises, the student goes at home, uses ChatGPT and comes up with output. That's why now there are anti-AI products that have come up, whose only job is to find out that the output that you've created, or that you've put up on the table, is it generated by artificial intelligence or not? So that being the case, it's a very fascinating space to come in, but a lot of new developments. And I think the legal fraternity, the legal profession, which is one of the uh, last professions to change the least in the last 300 years, is expected to now change the most in the next six years, thanks to artificial intelligence. Let's be part of this new revolution as we go forward. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Pawanji. Uh, how nicely you explained our artificial intelligence. Uh, further, uh, once again, you enlighten all of us. Uh, it's tempore, one way you can say that from an A to Z, we covered from world laws and other things, Indian laws, what could be what I mean. Before uh, question answers, I request Rahul Agarwal give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thanks, you, sir, for giving me the opportunity today. Uh, sir, you really enshrined us with this emerging law, technology, and artificial intelligence. As a going subject, we all are very keen to learn about it more and more. And every time we hear you, we learn very each and every aspect of it. And today, uh, sir, you covered each and every subject that how the uh, different different countries are uh, making the policies. Even some countries like China are making frame the laws for it. Even India is now framing the laws in 2024 or so for Digital India Act. So it's a very growing subject and we'll love to hear again and again from you, sir. And thank you. Yeah, for yeah. Huge clap, sir. <laughs> Any questions, please, sir, quickly, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, please. Please, come. Pavan, sir. Hi. As always, Hi. it was a real pleasure to hear you. Well, turn it is, uh, is again one such software anti-AI. I, you know, I, I was a uh, uh, reminded by you very kindly of my LLM days. Uh, so I still remember having a conversation with you regarding copyright and AI. So that's again one part of it. So my question to you is that you talked about the bias, the research which was, uh, you know, uh, taken up in the US. I actually went through that article, you know, regarding discrimination of whites and blacks. It also sort of uh, reminds me of FRTs, facial recognition technologies. And I believe, like, you know, if we actually think about it, do they have the potential of actually taking us to a stage of genocide of or wars for that matter? What is your take on that, sir? Well, the, uh, shall I say, potentiality of creating disastrous consequences by use of AI is going to be very high. And an example in this regard is the use of deepfakes. In the recent Pakistan elections, we found out there was one element that was the most predominant element that was the use of deepfakes in Pakistan elections. Come elections of India in May 2024, and we are expecting that there is going to be massive misuse or abuse of deep fake technology for a variety of purposes, for the purposes of changing people's mindsets, thought processes. So over a period of time, 
you cannot really uh, rule out the possibility that there will be some devious AI programs which could play with the human mind. Like for example, I'll give you two examples. Number one, a recent uh, example of a company and their uh, AI program. That AI program is thinking about itself as a god. And in one of the interactions with the users, the AI program is saying, you will have to worship me. That's one issue. Recently, some time back, in another jurisdiction, they found out that uh, two AI programs, algorithms, sitting on two computer systems, which were not connected to the, each other by the internet, started talking to each other in a language that humans were not able to understand. So the, uh, the kind of disastrous power that AI could have upon minds, upon societies, is going to be very high. Uh, today we are as lawyers, so we are talking about this. What about this class fourth student who is sitting in his home and who is using chat GPT for has his only uh, shining torch in his life to be guided by? So the chances are, if you are going to use a wrong material to, uh, go, to have a reference to, the chances of your mental concepts being warped are going to be very high. So over a period of time, if it's not going to be regulated, this could be a possibility. Right now it looks remote, but the problem is, from November 2022 till now March 2024, less than 15 months, and the kind of new developments that have taken place are a bit scary. And I think we need to be aware of the fact that the ch ultimate chance of artificial intelligence being misused against the interest of humanity is going to be very high. That's why a, a person like Elon Musk is saying that uh, artificial intelligence represents the next existential threat to human mankind. So therefore, there's a new call you must now regulate. But apart from that, we will have to start creating more capacities amongst people, amongst families. So as our earlier used to be said, teach your children about cybercrime, about AI. The time has come that we must tell them about these Gen AI programs and tell them not to rely upon these Gen AI programs. I call these generative AI programs as a mere torch in a field of darkness. It's only throwing you a light of the way forward. You will have to walk the walk yourself. But you can't really piggy ride on the torch to walk the walk. At the end of the day, it will be your own skill sets of how you go ahead and navigate the various challenges. But very quickly, guardians will have to be put in. Governments will have to be more and more serious on how we can regulate the misuse of AI. Because now AI is going to be extensively used for launching cyber security attacks on systems, on stealing your data. So the next time uh, Mr. ABC wants to target Mr. XYZ, he has to do nothing. He doesn't even have to go to humans. He only goes to AI algorithms and gives the commands and through prompt command engineering, he's able to get access to illegal content, which he can then use against those. So a lot of work needs to be done, but right now most of the countries are still in a wait and watch approach. They think, no, no, AI is well miles ahead. Why do we need to think of? That's why when I look at the Chinese law on AI, I realize these guys have done their homework much ahead in points of time. That's why uh, the commonality, whether it's China, whether it's European Union, whether it's America, is they're saying, let's begin by audits. But then auditing where and how? And who's got the skill sets to do the auditing? Recently, on 1st of March 2024, the Government of India, uh, the Ministry of Electronics and IT, has issued an advisory saying that all artificial intelligence players will have to get prior approval from the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology uh, and submitting their programs to audit before it can be released in the uh, public domain. So these are the directions how governments are looking forward. I don't think governments alone will be well equipped to deal with it. Every stakeholder will have to contribute in this regard and therefore the quickly we all collectively start realizing the negative ramifications, uh, it's going to be massive and people now routinely sharing their personal details on AI. If uh, some cyber criminal has to target you and demolish your online reputation or your online existence, AI as a simple tool as of now is very well sufficient to do that. Therefore, let's realize the devious uh, activities or the consequences of AI and start regulating to the best extent possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. What if Chennai uh, companies are blocked from accessing the data? Well, sir, for that, first and foremost, there needs to be an international agreement that these Gen AI com companies need to be regulated. Right now, there's no international agreement. Number two, most of these Gen AI companies are based in the US. Number three, most of these companies are saying that, sir, we are a service provider, we are covered under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, we are a pipe provider, so we don't know, we are not going to be liable for what flows in the <coughs> pipe, so don't make us liable. I think with those kind of provisions, we are beginning to have this huge problem. Therefore, countries are saying, at least in my jurisdiction, please submit your programs to me. I'm not so sure whether countries and the governments also have the technical wherewithal to go ahead and do the audit. 
and assuming to you do the audit, uh, what happens to the data that the governments are accessing? Is that safe? Can that be appropriately well protected and preserved? So that's a multi-million dollar question. But as a follow-up question, uh, what if this uh, data management company, say for Google, is not giving access to the GNI companies, and certain other servers are not giving access to the GNI companies, then how the GNI companies are going to process the data? Well, GNI companies will have to look at variety of uh, sources for processing of data. One is through the service providers. One is openly buying the set data on the superficial net. Number three is surreptitiously buying it on the dark net. Uh, number four is fabricating or poisoning the data well. And that's the biggest priority. The problem is when I don't get enough data, what do I do? I start fabricating data. That's what some companies have begun started doing. So they have started poisoning the well, the well of data. So once the, da the data well gets poisoned, the output that's going to come out of the AI will be dependent on the poisoned <coughs> waters that it, it's been fed on or trained on. That means so, the output is itself going to be potentially poisoned. So therefore, individualized national approaches on AI may not necessarily be very effective. You will have to have a look at some kind of international agreements in this case. In that case, Gemini will have an advantage when compared to ChatGPT, isn't it? Uh, well, ChatGPT, according to their uh, estimates, have already uh, collated the entire data of human mankind from the beginning of human civilization till 2021. And now with new tools like perplexity and other like that and the paid version of chat GPT, they are updating information up to the latest date on the internet. So you already have access to the Yes, uh, players like Google have access to their own proprietary data ecosystem. Because when I'm signing on a Gmail or a Google product, I'm actually telling them that look, my product is your property. You go ahead and uh, use my particular data. So they have access to that huge volumes of data. They would be using that. How they use that either for competitive advantage or otherwise We'll have to wait and watch, but it's a very, very, uh, shall I say, uh, very uneven boy poised kind of a game. There are going to be digital haves and digital have-nots. These companies who are now creating these AI platforms are going to get far more powerful as compared to other companies who either don't have the capacities to come up with AI algorithms or don't have the requisite data sets to feed the training of these algorithms. So it's a very, very gray zone. That's why, we are, you know, pe people like us are telling to the world the time for Dreaming is over. The time for action is now. I've been advising the government of India, the time for coming up with a dedicated law on AI is now because uh, most of the companies, countries are saying, well, if I'm going to legislate, will that hinder innovation? We are saying, don't go for an overkill. Don't hinder <coughs> innovation. But don't come up with the Wild Wild West ecosystem as well. There has to be some accountability of these service providers <coughs> when they're providing these kind of programs which are potentially poisoning or impacting the, the, the minds of children. So today, a child does not go to Google for search engine. He goes to the Gen AI program. And whatever the Gen AI program tells him, the child takes it as a gospel truth and starts building his own <coughs> mental calculations thereon. So you are actually playing with the childhood and the innocence of uh, children as that. Well. We need to be protecting and preserving that as we go forward. But I don't know about other. I'm so sorry. One more question. I don't know about others. This one more question. I don't know about others, but I feel that. Gemini is much better than ChatGPT. I mean, I don't know, subject to... Uh, <laughs> well, they are all yeah. mutual preferences, yeah. Yeah. but yes, each program has got... Yeah. Yeah. What you said and highlighted, like medical industry, now it is too much uh, driven by the software. Uh, all the insurance sector, banking sector, these are all software driven. And uh, entire banking, and, and these safety system, defense, defense, the machine technology, robotics, drone system, there are several sectors which will be affected. And as you said, the belief system. So the impact will not be only in one area. The impact will be multidimensional and uh, we are already late, I would say. And, uh, and everybody is investing in that. Reliance is investing. So the greed, the balance of greed and human welfare. Even Elon Musk is saying something, doing something. It's the same with the all corporate houses. They are investing in those areas. Investment is good. It is for the benefit of the mankind as well. But the regulations, it is already beyond the present even times, not much control. Like I'm using, I'm easy to use. It is easy to use, and uh, nobody can control me. It can harm me also. I'm not. I may not be aware. Sure. So uh, these things uh, to be taken care of by the government first. Now, I completely endorse your thought process. I believe that uh, the time to act is now. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, the morning started in the morning with the sunrise. 
we are right now standing on a railway platform. Three, four major trains have gone by. Just one or two more trains remain. Before, no train is going to come ever again. So, our only ray of hope is going to be that let's catch the last two trains before it's too late. I think that's a message that the, the governments of the world have to start realizing that the time to regulate is now. You cannot say I will be a spectator because in any case, you would be completely left out of uh, any kind of relevance because AI would have gone ahead and superseded almost a majority of your stuff. Today, the problem is governments are saying, I can't rely upon AI for my sovereign functions because that's my sovereign data. Understood. But is that stopping people? Is that stopping users from using data? Or is that stopping the arms race? Last year, there's an institute called the Future of Life Institute. It actually issued an open letter. And that was signed by about almost 1,500 experts globally. I was also a signatory. We said, look to all the big AI companies. Can you please stop your arms race of developing new AI only for six months? so that allow the legal frameworks to develop and come to base. The company said, we are not stopping. We are in an arms race, and that's not what's currently happening. Therefore, the quicker these actions have to be done, the better it's going to be. Sir, 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 Sir. Sir how, how significant is the role of ancestral model law in AI-related laws, like, and in adopting it in our municipal laws also? Sir, the ancestral model law in electronic commerce was a law only meant for promoting e-commerce in the electronic format in the mid-90s, 1996 got approved by the General Assembly on the 31st of January 1997. So the law was never kept in my, drafted, keeping in mind artificial intelligence. But now, because a majority of countries already have dedicated cyber laws on the basis of the UNCITRAL model law, you can say that the building blocks of AI pertaining to electronic data, pertaining to use of computer systems and networks, to that extent it could be covered. But the problem is AI is a new animal that we have created. It was never envisaged that we will create this. AI is nothing new. We began working on this in 1956. From 1956 till uh, the end of 2020, we still had uh, scenarios of ups and downs. There was a golden periods and there was a, uh, AI winters when there was no activity. But this generative AI has now completely changed the game plan. And everybody is now uh, going at it, creating their own AI algorithms. You go to this program called Chat GPT 4.0, it allows you to create your own customized GPT with just a few clicks. So I can create my own particular AI algorithm within the next five minutes, only peculiar to my particular needs or requirements, which could be accessible to the world at large. So we are opening up new doors. Therefore, the existing law may not be completely adequate, and we will have to come up with new frameworks in this regard. Thanks. Sure. Sure. Ma'am, thank you for that fantastic question. There's not just a plausibility, there's a very high possibility of AI being used in armed conflict. Why? Because armed conflict uh, is going to be dependent today, is going to be invariably be taken in the cyber ecosystem. So we'll have to go to no international laws. Further, though we are seeing the wars of the Ukraine and the Gaza, but they are exceptions. The, the, the wars of the future are all going to take place in cyber. Further, these physical world wars are already getting supplemented by cyber wars in the respective cyber spaces. That being so, AI is now increasingly being used by defense forces for the purposes of trying to proactively predict how the opponent is going to behave and to come up with appropriate counter strategies in this regard. So every uh, different countries have started coming up with their own ingenious AI platforms. They don't want to use the commercial platforms because they don't know where their data is going. But they are using AI in very extensive terms for the purposes of planning onslaught, uh, for the purposes of defense and offense, as far as cyber operations are concerned. Very well the precision Complete. And we still don't have legal frameworks uh, at a global level even to go ahead and prevent the state actors from going ahead and engaging in this kind of stuff. So it's right now an area where we are going towards a wild, wild west. We initially thought in the 90s when the internet had come across, it was a wild, wild west. Slowly, it's taken 30 years for the countries to come up with laws. Now for AI, it's still the wild, wild west, except it's not going to take 30 years. Maybe it's going to take five or six years for the world to realize that if we don't have now uh, the laws for regulating AI and its misuse, it's a state of annihilation. It's a state of extermination that you could potentially be facing. And therefore, if it's a matter of your existence, you have no choices but to face the enemy rise on its face. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. So when now we are in the era of conventional and non-conventional war, 
so while we use this ai technology so aren't we footing towards the ethical war well when we are using ai technologies does ethics have a role to play because uh, you need to be ethical for following ethical standards but if i am a rogue actor a rogue state actor or a rogue non state actor ethical principles are the least of my priority why because i have a one point agenda to fulfill my vested interests so expecting all kinds of state and non state actors to only abide by ethical standards is not going to be a reality yes till such time ethical principles are substantially backed up by legal principles by the force of penality then of course there could be some kind of a persuasion of force <coughs> but right now if i uh, give with folded hands request you to follow ethical standards in ai the chances are that you as a state or a non state actors are not likely to listen to such kind of pleas you will only do things which is beneficial for you or your for your own vested interests and therefore till such time globally we don't have certain uh, common parameters on how to regulate the misuse of ai we are going to be actually working towards an area of more more shall i say wild wild west more potential destruction more disaster and more potential ramifications of misuse that's currently happening and we are still talking about ai here what about the misuse of ai in space on the space satellites how about ai going and triggering off some yeah some unwarranted activity on the said satellites that could go ahead and trigger off maybe a complete uh, washing off the internet at world at large so we don't exactly know but right now it's a kind of a brahmastra mm-hmm. on which we are sitting it's a it's a boiling volcano it's not yet burst we don't know when it's going to be burst okay. but it's only a question of time when it's going to be burst therefore the quicker okay. we are able to try to avoid ourselves from getting burnt on this burst of brahmastra is what has to be the mantra as we go forward <coughs> it's fine thank you thank you very much thank you kindly join for a cup of tea thank so, you sir yeah, we will take your autograph oh, thank you and uh, any valuable uh, suggestion for friday group taking it to your international uh, exposure and other thing please uh, just share with others i mean sure i would like to uh, welcome all the members of this uh, group to our annual conference that we do every year it's called the international conference on cyber law cyber crime and cyber security uh, my law firm pavandugal associates and i have been doing it for the last 10 years this is the 11th year it takes place from the 13th to the 15th of november 2024 here in delhi so I'd like to welcome all of you there number 1 number 2 in delhi we have created something known as artificial intelligence law hub which i am heading where we are actually going at in uh, evaluating the collation of legal principles and practices for the legal regulation of ai and we are doing a lot of work so if any one of you is interested and would like to contribute we'll be happy to have you on board and if you require in any of your matters any assistance we are able to assist in any manner whatsoever look we are a fraternity we are a community together we have to hand hold each other i have only shared so much that i know and i can tell you i know hardly anything the more i scratch the surface the more i realize that i don't know much but having said that i think ai is going to be a fantastic teacher is going to keep on teaching us that you you as humans are vulnerable you don't know much i will know far more than you so the bigger question and the bigger challenge will be how will we go ahead and conquer this massive supremacy of ai that's looming right in front of us in the coming horizon in the coming times thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.